Welcome back, my friends. PCZ TV is continuing in this series to examine the literary world of James Bond and his weapons loadout. This video will focus on Fleming's novels from Live and Let Die to From Russia with Love. Pre Boothroyd Fleming is not always entirely clear on what the actual kit is, so there will be lots of speculation. Stay tuned with PCZ TV as we dive into Literary Bond. Episode 2 Fleming's Firearms. In the last video, we examined in detail Ian Fleming, his background, the impact of the era he wrote in, and his expertise vis a vis firearms. We also did a deep dive into the Beretta. Bond's primary sidearm of this era. I won't belabor the Beretta 418 in this video, but if you want to see this topic flogged to death, see the last video. Instead, we'll focus this video on the pre Boothroyd era. Fleming started to rely on Boothroyd for firearms expertise, starting with Dr. No, so it makes sense to look at Fleming's firearms as a standalone. We'll start off with Live and Let Die. In the novel, it's Beretta, 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 blah, blah, blah. It's not until Chapter 8 that Bond handles anything other than the Beretta. And it's a cult detective special with a sawn barrel. In my last video, I speculated Bond's sawn cult was a banker special. Why? Uh, because they were chambered in a 38 caliber round that was also the British military's standard cartridge, the 38 Smith & Wesson, also known as the 38 Colt New Police. During the war, this cartridge was chambered in Webley revolvers and were also used in the Lend-Lease Smith & Wessons. So that's why I thought Bond carried the Banker Special. It was a variant of the Detective Special, but as it chambered the British Standard Military cartridge, it had a shorter cylinder than the typical Colt Detective Special by around one-eighth of an inch. It made it the smallest of the Colts. The Banker's special production stopped during World War II. But Fleming gets more specific here and calls out the model by name. Excellent. So what is a detective special? Time for Colt Revolver History. The father of the detective special was the Fitz special, which was literally a Colt with a sawn barrel, albeit done by the factory. The Fitz Special was developed by John Henry Fitzgerald, also known as Fitz, an employee of Colt Firearms, who created the first short barrel revolvers in the 20s based on the standard size revolver frame models. As such, these could be chambered for just about any cartridge, even up to 45 Colt and 45 ACP. Very powerful rounds for such a light gun. The Detective Special took this idea of a short barrel revolver, but based the model on the Colt small frame revolvers. The chamberings were from 32 to 38 Special, still stout performers for the size of the revolver, however. So now, we've established the model Bond had. Except, here's where Fleming creates some confusion. He still calls it a sawn barrel. A Detective Special has a short barrel from the factory. It's available in two and three inch varieties. So is Fleming saying that it's a sawn barrel shorter than that? If one starts with a two inch and shortens it, does that mean it's a one inch barrel? Well, that doesn't make any sense. My guess is this. It goes back to Fleming and his love of the imagery of the words skeleton and sawn. I'm guessing he uses the term sawn to indicate a short barrel, not intending to reduce the two inch barrel down to a one inch barrel, but rather indicates it's just a short barrel. Unless of course he literally took a larger colt and sawn down the barrel, but it wouldn't be called a detective special then. In the US, these short barrel revolvers are typically known as stub nose or snubbies. Perhaps Fleming just preferred the term sawn over snub nose. Eh? I'm open for ideas, thoughts? Leave them in the comments. Let's move on. 
The final firearm mentioned in the novel is the one used by the baddie. He was cleaning a rifle that looked to Bond like a Remington 30. The Remington Model 30 is a rifle of the interwar period based on the military P-14 Enfield rifle action. It's a bolt action rifle offered in eight different calibers with a five round magazine. This is entirely plausible for a rifle of the period. Moonraker, the next novel in line for the PCZ TV examination. It's intermission, so let's have a few adult beverages before we move on. And Bond is back using a Colt Detective Special, a short barrel revolver, during the portion of the book when Bond is at the target range. Okay, one usually doesn't do a short barrel revolver firearm as a target pistol, as the short barrel decreases accuracy. Fleming has the firearms instructor suggest Bond to use a Remington in 22 long rifle to win the Dewar Trophy. This is actually a very sound piece of advice. The Olympic Games, for instance, use both air pistols and 22 LR pistols in some of their competitions. The 22s themselves are small caliber long barrel guns. Here's an image of an older Walther GSP actually used in the Olympics. In a strange twist of irony, these Olympic pistols are categorized by New York and Chicago as assault weapons. Such is the state of American gun laws. On an aside, the Dewar Trophy confuses me. I had thought it was associated with the Royal Automobile Club and was car related. It's named after the Scottish whiskey family and is awarded for outstanding British technical achievement in the automotive industry. But tangent over, let's return to Fleming's firearms. Now, if you recall, Fleming had the range master recommend a Remington. I assume he meant pistol. If so, this sounds great, except Remington didn't make a 22 pistol in this era. The last Remington pistol available in this time frame would have been Model 51, which was made from 1918 through 1926. And even then, it did not offer the 22 long rifle caliber during this production run. It was only offered in 32 and 380. Do you intend to suggest a rifle? Uh, it's not clear to me. Personally, I think this is an instance of Fleming falling in love with the Remington name regardless of the products they actually offered. Well, we've established Fleming loves certain terms. Skeleton, sawn, and now we add another. Long barrel. In chapter 25, M advises Bond that a long barrel colt was found. Cue much discussion about a long barrel colt. Fleming has shown quite a liking to the colt police positive, so it's natural to assume that this references to a long barrel revolver, such as the police positive. In one of the few cases where we'll cheat and look ahead in the novels, we see that in a later short story in the For Your Eyes Only compilation, specifically the short story From a View to, to a Kill, Fleming indicates that this weapon has a safety catch. American revolvers do not have safety catches. So what is a long barrel Colt? And here's where PCZ TV will speculate. Given that the standard barrel is four inch on a revolver, one can guess that anything larger than that must be a long barrel. Well, what has a barrel longer than four inch, a safety catch, and is made by Colt? So here's the possible answer. Is Fleming referring to the five inch barrel of a Colt automatic? It has the long barrel and a safety catch and is a Colt. I would argue that this is the most famous automatic ever made, the quintessential model 1911. It seems to fit the bill. Although the 1911 is not typically referred to as a long barrel Colt, I think calling it a 45 is probably more typical but I think this is Fleming just relying on his vague sort of firearms knowledge and trying to describe them in cool ways. 
Or perhaps uh, Fleming just meant a long barrel revolver during this period of his writing. Hard to know, but this is my best guess. Either way, long barrel revolver or 1911, they're both excellent choices. Next up is 1956's Diamonds Are Forever. Mainly Beretta mentions again, including chapter 6 where he ran his hand down the blue barrel from the tip of which he had personally sawn the blunt foresight. Note the use of sawn again. And, well, frankly, some weird imagery going on from Mr. Fleming. Awkward. Let's move on. Quickly. In Chapter 14, Bond describes some of the baddies' guns. 45 might have been a Colt. As we have speculated earlier, this could mean either a 1911 or a Colt revolver. Unclear. The other gent was carrying a 38 police positive. Again, quite a common gun in the world of Fleming. The police positive gets seen again in Chapter 19. After that, lots of generic gun descriptions, such as in Chapter 19, where all we know about them is from the description of full Western regalia and ivory gripped revolvers. Well, this sounds like the classic cowboy gun, the Colt Peacemaker, the gun that won the Western movie. Big old single action pistols, they look great and are classics of the genre. Now, I wouldn't choose one for modern situations, but they still work great and they shoot a variety of cartridges. Given Fleming is probably familiar with Hollywood cowboy movies, it makes sense that he means this revolver, but that's just my guess. The next bit of kit is the biggest bang of them all. I'm not entirely sure if the truck pulled the anti-aircraft gun or if it was mounted, but either way, a Bofors refers to the Bofors 40mm automatic gun L60. It's an anti-aircraft autocannon designed in the 1930s by the Swedish arms manufacturer AB Bofors. And 40mm, yes, 40mm, you heard that right. The round is huge. This is a very big bullet indeed. And were it to be mounted on the truck, I'd wager the truck mount would be a C9 Morris truck. It is an English manufacturer, after all. And Bond is the one who finishes off the helicopter with the Bofors. To be honest, I sort of like the thought that the Bofors is mounted on the back of an English truck. Seems very Bond and British to me. Finally for this series is From Russia With Love. On the surface, from a firearms perspective, maybe not terribly interesting. Beretta, of course, highlighted seven times through the course of the discussion. Grant has a specialized assassination weapon, a 25 caliber hidden in a book, a true bespoke spy gun. Interestingly, I could only find one example of a gun disguised as a book. In the 1600s, Francesco Morosini had a gun inserted into the Holy Bible and, while the Bible was still unopened, pulling out the silk bookmark would actually shoot the gun. Now, I'm pretty sure that Christians would frown upon turning the Holy Bible into a deadly weapon. Seems somewhat sacrilegious. For more information on this weapon, check the link in the description below. Now, Karim also has a unique weapon, a bespoke sniper rifle. Barrel from the new 88 Winchester, put together for me by a man in Ankara. Fleming sure loves his lever guns. The Model 88 was introduced in 1955, just a few years before From Russia With Love was published, so it's still a very modern, contemporary firearm. The Model 88 was advertised along with the then-new 308 Winchester cartridge as the world's first and only lever-action hunting rifle with target rifle accuracy. And speaking of new, the 308 Winchester is a full-power rifle cartridge. It was unveiled to the commercial market in 1952, 
developed from the 300 Savage cartridge and designed to give comparable to performance to the 30-06 Springfield, but in a shorter cartridge case. It is essentially the 762 by 51 millimeter NATO cartridge. Oh, but wait, there's more. This cool modified toy also has a sniper scope, German model, infrared lens. Okay, this one has me stumped. While the British had some infrared scopes in World War II, by the time of the Korean War, the British were using night vision equipment supplied by the United States. This would be the M1 or the M3 infrared night sighting devices, the sniper scope or snooper scope, uh, which saw limited service in the U.S. Army at the end of World War II and in the Korean War. These were active devices using a large infrared light source to illuminate their targets. These things weighed a ton. They were super bulky and usually mounted on M1 carbines, which themselves are not exactly known as sniper rifles. But he mentions a German model. Well, during World War II, the Germans did have a unit deployed. The ZG-1229 Vampire was an active infrared device developed for the Wehrmacht for the STG-44 assault rifle. It was intended primarily for night use, as one would expect. It was used in small numbers on the Eastern Front. The system was heavy, with the device itself and the battery weighing 33 pounds. So is it this model? Is it the American model? At this point, your guess is as good as mine. Ah, but the best is yet to come. As Bond has supposed, it was a gun, a rifle, with a skeleton grip butt, but was also a twist breech. The skeleton grip is back. Skeletons? Ah, my closet is full of them. And Fleming just loves the term. Now, putting that skeleton back in the closet, the other notable mention is a twist breech. Breach. These are not common actions, and as this is a custom build, well, the designer is free to use any action he wants. Now, I wasn't familiar with his action, so the best description I found was about, appropriately enough, custom rifles. Link in the description. They explain the function this way. To open the action and expose the chambers for loading, twist the barrels a quarter turn to the right. This engages or excuse me, disengages the two massive locking lugs. Push forward about a quarter inch to expose the plate and the barrel's now hinged down. Why is the big question. According to the designer, it's simplicity and durability. A traditional brake action pivots down below an axis of power. So when you fire, it gets a lot of pressure and stress in different areas. Traditional rifle actions create stress, which is literally trying to rip itself apart. None of this happens in the twist breech because the locking lugs are directly in line with the chambers, rigidly and evenly connecting breech and barrels. Or at least so the designer says. Well this is interesting, but I'm not sure why you would need it on a 308, but there you go. One final interesting tidbit is the cover. While the writing of the book may have been complete, Boothroyd's influence can start to be seen, because on the cover is none other than Jeffrey Boothroyd's own sawn barrel revolver. Literally. It's a Smith & Wesson that had been partially fit specialed. Is that a word? In other words, shortened. The Royal Armories, link in the description, has a page dedicated to this particular Smith & Wesson M&P, Military Police, aka Model 10. It has been argued that Boothroyd's revolver is inspired by the Fitz, and I think you can see it readily. Boothroyd didn't completely copy all features, however, as he retained the hammer spur and added target sights. And not being an employee of Colt, Boothroyd was free to choose the brands, and he chose a Smith & Wesson revolver. Ultimately, it's a pretty cool conversion. I suppose you could argue it's a Boothroyd special, but for the life of me, I'm not sure why he didn't just get a Smith & Wesson Model 10 with a short barrel. Fun fact, 
If you look at the painting on the cover, you can see the manufacturer's stamp on the barrel has been cut down along with the barrel. It's no longer a Smith & Wesson, it's an H & Wesson. Congratulations, you've made it this far. Time for a nightcap and a recap. Live and Let Die, Cult Detective Special. Description is confusing, but overall, good choice. Remington 30, yep. Moonraker, again, Cult Detective Special, yes. Uh, Remington 22 caliber. Mm, no. Long Barrel Colt. I say 1911. I say yes. Diamonds are forever. 38 police positive. Solid choice. Colt Peacemaker. Classic. Bofors. If you really have to shoot down a helicopter, you can't really argue with that choice. From Russia with Love. 25 book gun. Eh, sure. It's a, it's a spy thing. Bespoke Turkish-made rifle with German infrared scopes. Sounds nifty. Sure. I'm just glad it has a skeleton grip. And then Boothroyd Smith & Wesson. Interesting modification choices, but still very functional. So there you have it. The pre-Boothroyd era comes to a close. Fleming's descriptions are, in some cases, cryptic. In the next video, we'll dive into the post-Boothroyd Bond sagas and see what, if any, influence Jeffrey Boothroyd had on Bond, as well as looking at the influence the movies started to have on the novels. Until then, cheers. Bye!